Chapter One of Mister Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tommy Hersant, Carlsbad, California. Mister Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey, Case One: The Ascot Tragedy. That is what it would have been called in the evening papers if they had known all about it. They did not. They made the most of the mystery. You remember, it was not good for them、uh, or you to know、uh, that the sequel was a sequel. But there is no reason why the flats should not be joined now. So let us begin at Ascot on the morning of that Cup Day, one of our fine summers. The course rather yellow, the lawns rather brown, a haze of heat over the distant woodland, and sunshine flaming about the flounces and silk hats. There were already many of both in the royal enclosure. It was a year of flounces, and among them. Dapper, debonair, everybody's friend, the youngest middle-aged man in Europe. He, of course, is the Honourable Sidney Lomas, the chief of the Criminal Investigation Department, though mistaken by some outsiders、uh, for a comic actor of fame. Tripping back from a joke with the stewards, he discovered sprawling solitary on the end of one of the seats, Mister Fortune. The adviser of him and all other official and important people, when surgery, medicine, or kindred sciences can elucidate what is or is not a crime, no one looks more prosperous than Reginald Fortune. He is plump and pinkly healthy. He and his tailor treat each other with respect. His countenance has the amiability of a nice boy. But on this occasion, Lomas found fault with him. Why, Fortune, you're very pensive. Have you lost the lady of your present affections, or backed a wrong un? <laughs> Go away. No fellow has a right to be as cool as you look. Go quite away. I I feel like the three fellows in the Bible who sang in the furnace. How can you jest, Lomas? I have no affections. I cannot love. To bet I am ashamed. I always win half crowns. Why is the world thus, Lomas? My dear fellow, you're not yourself. You look quite professional. Reggie Fortune groaned. I am. This place worries me. I am anatomical. Ethnological, anthropological. Good God," said Lomas. "Yes, a distressing place. Look at it." He waved a stick. The people in the royal enclosure were as pleasant to behold as usual. Calmly, girls and women who had been calmly passed in frocks, of which many were pretty and few garish. Their men were of a blameless, inconspicuous uniformity. What is he? said Reggie Fortune. I ask you, look at his feet. What Lomas saw was a man dressed like all the rest of them and as well set up, but of a darker complexion. He did not see anything remarkable. Oh, the big fellow," he said.、Uh, "He is a little weak at the knee, but、uh, what's the matter with him? Who is he?" said Reggie Fortune. Lomas shrugged.、Oh, "Not English, of course.、Uh, uh, rather a half-caste color, isn't he?、Uh, from one of the smaller legations, I suppose, Balkan or South American." He waved a hand to some elegant aliens who were at that moment kissing ladies' hands with florid grace. They all come here, you know. I don't know," said Reggie Fortune peevishly. "Half caste, a half what caste? Look at his feet." Now the man's feet, well displayed beneath white spats, were large and flat, but distinguished. 
by their heels, which stuck out behind extravagantly. Well, that is the Negro heel. My dear fortune, the fellow is no more a Negro than I am, Lomas protested, and indeed the man's hair was straight and sleek, and he had a good enough nose, and he was far from black. A the Negro or Hamitic heel, Reggie Fortune drowsily persisted. I suspect the Hamitic or Negro leg, and otherwise up above. And it's all very distressing, Lomas. An Egyptian, or perhaps an Arab, probably a foreign office pet, Lomas consoled him. Uh, that would get him into the royal enclosure. Lomas was then removed by a duchess, and Reggie Fortune tilted his hat still further over his eyes and pondered whether it would be wise to drink before lunch and was dreamily aware of other people on his seat, an old man, darkly tanned and soldiery in the custody of a little woman, brilliantly dressed and terribly vivacious. She chattered without a pause. She made eyes. She made affectionate movements and little caresses. The old man, though hapless, seemed to be thinking of something else and Reggie Fortune sketched lower and still lower estimates of human nature. They went away at last, when everybody went away, to gather in a crowd at the gates and along the railings for the coming of the king. You will please to observe that the time must have been about one o'clock. Reggie Fortune, one of the few, remained on his seat. He heard the cheering down the course, and had sufficient presence of mind to stand up and take off his hat as the distant band began to play. Over the heads of the crowd he saw the red coats of the postilions, and the gleam of the gray of the team as the king's carriage swept round into the enclosure. The rest of the procession passed, and the crowd melted away. But one man remained by the railings alone. He was tall and thin, and he leaned limply against the railings, one arm hanging over them. After a little while, he turned on his heel and fell in a heap. Two of the green-coated wardens of the gate ran up to him. "'Oh, Lord!' Reggie Fortune groaned. "'Why did I be a doctor?' But before he could get through the flurry of people, the man was being carried away. The gift of Lomas for arriving where he wants to be displayed itself. Lomas slid through the crowd and took his arm. A stout fellow, uh, come along. It's Sir Arthur Dean. A touch of sun, what? Arthur Dean, uh, that's the Persian man, a pundit on the Middle East. Uh, that's the fellow, uh, getting old, you know, one of the best. Into the room where the old man lay came the shouting over the first race. Merry men, merry men, merry men, the crowd roared outside. Reggie straightened his bent back and stood looking down at his patient. Lomas came forward. Uh, anything we can get you, Fortune? Uh, would you like some assistance? Uh, we can't assist him, said Reggie. Uh, he's dead. Merry man! The crowd triumphed. Merry man! Good gad, said Lomas. Poor fellow, one of the best. Well, well, uh, what is it, a heart failure? The heart generally fails when you die, Reggie mumbled. He still stared down at the body, and the wanted benignity of his face was lost in expressionless reserve. Oh, do you know if he has any people down here? Oh, it's possible. Uh, there is a married son. I'll have him looked for, Lomas sent his inspector off. I saw the old man with a woman just before he died, Reggie murmured, and Lomas put up his eyeglass. Oh, did you, though? Oh, very sudden, wasn't it? And he was all alone when he died. Uh, when he fell, 
Reggie mumbled the correction. Yes, highly sudden. Uh, what was the cause of death, Fortune? I wonder, Reggie muttered. He went down on his knees by the body. He looked long and closely into the eyes. He opened the clothes. And to the eyes he came back again. Then there was a tap at the door, and Lomas, having conferred there, came back and said, uh, The son and his wife, uh, I'll tell them. I suppose they can see the body? Uh, they'd better see the body, said Reggie. And as Lomas went out, he began to cover and arrange it. He was lying the right arm by the side when he checked and held it up to the light. On the back of the hand was a tiny drop of blood and a red smear. He looked close and found such a hole as a pin might make. From the room outside came a woman's cry, then a deep man's voice in some agitation, and Lomas opened the door. Uh, this is Mr. Fortune, the surgeon who was with your father at once, uh, Major Dean and Mrs. Dean Fortune. Reggie bowed and studied them. The man was a soldiery fellow with his father's keen, wary face. But it was the woman Reggie watched, the woman who was saying, I was with him only half an hour ago, and twisting her hands nervously. Most of that half hour he has been dead. Uh, where did you leave him, madam? Reggie said. Oh, why, in the royal enclosure, of course. Uh, in the crowd, when the king came, I, I lost him. Somebody spoke to me. Uh, yes, it was Sybil, and, and I never saw him again. Reggie stepped aside from the body. She shuddered and hid her face in her hands. His eyes, his eyes, she murmured. Major Dean blew his nose. This rather knocks me over, he said. What's the cause of death, sir? Uh, can you help me, said Reggie. I, uh, what do you mean? Uh, nothing wrong with his heart, was there? Uh, never heard of it. Uh, he didn't use doctors, never was ill. Reggie stroked his chin. I suppose he hadn't been to an oculist lately? Oh, not he. His eyes were as good as mine. Wonderful good. Uh, he used to brag of it. He was rising seventy and no glasses. Mm. Good Lord, what's that got to do with it? Uh, I want to know why he died. Uh, so do I. And I can't tell you, said Reggie. What I say? What? You mean a post-mortem? Oh, that's horrible. Oh, my dear Major, it is most distressing, Lomas purred. I assure you anything in our power. Sympathize with your feelings quite, quite. But the coroner would insist, you know, uh, we have no choice. Uh, as you were saying, uh, Reggie chimed in, uh, we want to know why he died. Major Dean drew a long breath. That's all right, that's all right, he said. The old dad. And he came to his father's side and knelt down. And his wife stood by him, her hand on his shoulder. He looked a moment into the dead face and closed the eyes and looked long. From this scene, Reggie and Lomas drew back. In the silence they heard the man and woman breathing unsteadily. Lomas sighed his sympathy. Mrs. Dean whispered, His mouth, O oh Claude, his mouth, and with a sudden darting movement wiped away some froth from the pale lips. Then she too knelt, and she kissed the brow. Her husband lifted the dead right hand to hold it for a while. And then he reached across to the keychain, took off the keys, slipped them into his pocket, and helped his wife to her feet. Reggie turned a still expressionless face on Lomas. Lomas still exhibited grave official sorrow. Uh, well, er, uh, thanks very much for all you've done. Major Dean addressed them both. 
You've been very kind. We feel that. And if you will let me know as soon as you know anything, uh, rather a relief. Oh, quite, quite. Lomas held out his hand. Major Dean took it. Ah, yes, I'm so sorry, but you see, we must take charge of everything for the present. He let the major's hand go, and still held out his own. Dean flushed. What, uh, his keys? Ah, thank you, said Lomas, and at last received them. I was thinking about his papers, you know. I can promise you they'll be safe. Oh, well, (laughs) that settles it, Dean laughed. You know where to find me. And he took his wife, who was plainly eager to speak to him, away. Lomas dandled the keys in his hand. I wonder what's in their minds, and what's in yours, Fortune? Man was murdered, said Reggie. Lomas groaned. I was afraid you had that for me. Oh, but surely it's not possible. It ought not to be, Reggie admitted. At a quarter to one he was quite alive, rather bored perhaps, but as fit as me. At a quarter past he was dead. What happened in between? Oh, why, he was in sight the whole time, all among the most respectable people in England. Yet he dies suddenly of asphyxia and heart failure? Why? Oh, well, uh, some obscure heart trouble, Lomas protested. He was in the pink. He never used doctors. You heard them say so. He hadn't even been to an oculist. A fellow doesn't always know, Lomas urged. There are all sorts of heart weakness. Oh, not this sort, Reggie shook his head. And the eyes. Did you see how those two were afraid of his eyes? Your eyes won't look like that when you die of heart failure. They might if an oculist had put belladonna in them to examine you. But there was no oculist. Dilated pupils, foam at the mouth, cold flesh. He was poisoned. It might have been oconitine. Hmm. But oconitine don't kill so quick or quite so quiet. Uh, what is oconitine? Oh, wolfbane, uh, blue rocket. Uh, you can get it from other plants. Only this is too quick. Uh, It slew him like uh, prussic acid, and much more peacefully. Some alkaloid poison of the aconite family, possibly unclassified. Hmm. Probably it was put into him by that fresh puncture in his hand while he was packed in the crowd. Uh, Just a scratch, just a, a jab with a hollow needle. An easy murder if you could trust your stuff. And when we do the post-mortem, we'll find that everything points to death by a poison we can't trace. Thanks so much, said Lomas. And as for this, we employ experts. Well, the police also must earn their bread. Uh, Who is he? Uh, He was the great authority on the Middle East, old Indian civilian, long retired. Lately, uh, political advisor to the government of media. Uh, You know all that. Yes. Who wanted him dead? said Reggie. Oh, my dear fellow. Lomas spread out his hands. The world is wide. Yes, the world also is very evil. The time also is waxing late, same like the hymn says. What about those papers the son and company were so keen on? Lomas laughed. If you could believe I have a little intelligence, it would so soothe me. Our people have been warned to take charge of his flat. Active fellow. Let's go and see what they found. 
It was not much more than an hour before a policeman was letting them into Sir Arthur Dean's flat in Westminster. An inspector of police led the way to the study. "'Anything of interest, Martin?' Lomas said. Uh, "'Well, sir, uh, nothing you could call out of the way. Uh, "'When we came, the servants had heard of the death, and they were upset. Uh, "'Sir Arthur's man, he opened the door to me, fairly crying. Hmm. Uh, "'Been with him thirty years, fine, old-fashioned fellow, "'would be talking about his master.' Lomas and Reggie looked at each other, but the inspector swept on. Uh, Then in this room, sir, uh, there was Sir Arthur's executor, Colonel Osbert, getting out papers. I had to tell him that wouldn't do. Uh, Rather stiff he was. He is a military man. Uh, Well, sir, I put it to him, orders are orders, and he took it very well, but he let me see pretty plain he didn't like it. He was quite the gentleman, uh, but he put it to me. We had no business in Sir Arthur's affairs unless we thought there was foul play. Well, of course, I couldn't answer that. Uh, He talked a good deal, uh, fishing, you might say. All he got out of me was that I couldn't allow anything to be touched. So he said he would take it up with the commissioner and went off. Oh, that's all, sir. Uh, who is he? said Reggie. Uh, his card, sir. Uh, Colonel Osbert, a late Indian army. Um, do you know if he was who he said he was? Lomas asked. The inspector was startled. Oh, well, sir, the servants knew him. Uh, Sir Arthur's man, he let him in. Uh, Says he's uh, Sir Arthur's oldest friend. I had no reason to detain him. Uh, That's all right, Morton, said Lomas. Well, uh, what time did you get here? Uh, Your message came two o'clock, sir. I should say we were here by a quarter past. Lomas nodded and dismissed him. "'Quick work,' he said, with a cock of his eye at Reggie. "'We can time it all by the king. Hmm. "'He drove up the course at ten past one. "'Till the procession came, Sir Arthur was alive. "'We didn't pick him up till five minutes after at the least.' No one knew he was dead till you had examined him. No one knew then but me and my men. And yet, Colonel Osbert in London knows of the death in time to get round here and get to work on the dead man's papers before 2.15. He knew the man was dead as soon as we did, who were looking at the body. Damn, he has very early information. Yes, one to you, Lomas, and a nasty one for Colonel Osbert, our active and intelligent police force. If you hadn't been up and doing and sent your bright boys around, Colonel Osbert might have got away with what he wanted, and he wouldn't have had to explain how he knew too much. Uh, When was the poison given, say between uh, five to one and ten past? At that time the murderer was in the royal enclosure. If he had his car waiting handy, uh, could he get here before 2.15? Well, if his car was a flyer and there were no flies on his chauffeur and he had luck all the way, I suppose it's possible. But I don't believe in it. I should say Osbert didn't do the job. Lomas sprang up and called the inspector. He wanted to know what Colonel Osbert was wearing. Colonel Osbert was in a lounge suit of gray flannel. Lomas sat down again and lit a cigarette. I'm afraid that will do for an alibi, Fortune, 
he sighed. Your hypothetical murderer was in the royal enclosure. Uh, therefore, uh, he was in topper and tails, same like us, the uniform of respectability. Of course, he could have done a change in his car, but I don't think it, no. Osbert won't do. But what was he after? Lomas stood up and looked round the room. It had the ordinary furniture of an old-fashioned study, and, in addition, several modern steel chests of drawers for filing documents. Well, he set some value on his papers, Lomas said. Lots of honest toil before you, Lomas, old thing. Reggie smiled, and while Lomas fell to work with the keys, he wondered about picking up a bowl here, a brass tray there. Uh, he kept to his own line, he remarked. Everything is Asiatic. Uh, you may well say so, Lomas groaned, frowning over a mass of papers. But Reggie's attention was diverted. Somebody had rung the bell, and there was talk in the hall. He made out a woman's voice. "'I fancy this is our young friend of the daughter-in-law,' he murmured. Lomas looked at him. "'I had a notion you didn't take to her fortune. Uh, do you want to see her?' "'God forbid,' said Reggie. "'She's thin, Lomas. She's too thin.' In a moment or two, a discreet tap introduced Inspector Morton. A uh, Mrs. Dean, a deceased daughter-in-law, sir, he reported, asked to see the man-servant. I saw no objection, uh, me being present. Uh, they were both much distressed, sir. Uh, she asked him if Colonel Osbert had been here. Seemed upset when she heard he was here before us. Asked if he had taken anything away. Uh, the servant told her we weren't letting anything be touched. Uh, that didn't seem to satisfy her. Uh, she said something nasty about the police being always too late. Uh, meant for me, I suppose." "'I rather fancy it was meant for me,' said Reggie. "'It's a bad business.' "'I don't think the Colonel got away with anything, sir. Uh, "'He was sitting down to the diary on the table uh, there when we came in.' "'All right,' Lomas waved him away. "'Damn, it is a bad business. "'What am I to do with this, Fortune?' "'He held up papers and a strange script.' papers of all sorts and sizes, some torn and discolored, some fresh. Reggie went to look. Arabic, he said, and this is Persian. He studied them for a while. A sort of dossier, a, a lot of evidence about some case or person. Loomis, old thing, you'll have to call in the foreign office. Lord, we can translate them ourselves. It's the mass of it. Oh, uh, yes, a <laughs> lot of light reading. I think I should have a talk to the foreign office. Oh, uh, well, uh, that's your show. Me for the body. Lomas lay back in his chair. What's in your head? I won't let anything into my head. There is no evidence. But I'm wondering if we'll ever get any. It's a beautiful crime, uh, as a crime. A wicked world, Lomas, old thing. End of section one.